Hi, Dr. Cassie. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Lauren. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> well, so start by telling everyone about your background and why you wanted to write Happier Hour. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm a researcher. Um, I'm a professor. At, um, I've been at business schools my whole life. Um, and it was actually earlier in my career when I was an assistant professor at Wharton where I was studying happiness, um, but I felt that for my, the biggest barrier for my own happiness was time. <laughs> and there was this sort of night that I remember so vividly on the train where I was coming back uh, to Philly from giving talks in New York. And I'd caught the very last train that would get me home to my four month old and my husband. And I remember as I was like looking out the windows, the night lights whizzing by, I was like, I don't know if I can keep up, right? Between the pressures of work, wanting to be a good parent, a partner, good friend, the never ending pile of chores, there simply weren't enough hours in the day to get it all done, let alone do any of it well, let alone to enjoy any of it along the way. And I wanted more time. And I very sort of very much was like, I think in this unhappy space, which I now in my work refer to as time poverty, that acute feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. I was like, <laughs> I think the solution is that I need to quit. Like yeah. I need to quit. I'm Imagine not that <laughs> yeah, Right. In those hectic moments, um, just thinking like <laughs> my daydream is always like living on a desk, like a beach island. And I'm like, oh, then I would have all the days to relax and spend my hours exactly how I wanted, because then I would be happier. Um, and I can talk about my research yeah. that sort of <laughs> explored whether that is true, whether people who have a whole lot more time are happier. But I recognize that for me, I needed to figure out empirically how do we manage time? How do we not just manage time to be more productive, how do we spend the hours of our days to feel some joy in those days so that we're not just sort of rushing through our lives in this blur so that at the end of our years, we don't look back with regret. And that's actually been what has determined my research agenda since then. And I, um, based off of my research, sadly, <laughs> it's an academic not a lot of people read our peer reviewed, you know, papers. <laughs> and, but I'm like, there's actually a lot of insight here. And so five years ago, I developed a course. So I'm now at UCLA and I was pulling together the science of happiness and in particular, how we should invest our time, both my own research as well as that of my colleagues. And I developed this course, Applying the Science of Happiness to Life Design. And in seeing that I teach the MBAs and our executive MBAs and seeing the impact on them, both in their day-to-day -day lives during the quarter, but as well as now years on hearing back from them of how these insights have really sort of impacted decisions like at the day-to-day -day level, how they engage, but also some bigger life decisions of like what job to take, where to live. Yeah. Um, and so that sort of propelled me. I'm like, there's some learnings here. And yes. when I was approached to write the book, I did so that these learnings could reach a broader audience. I love that because I've absolutely had that thought. It's funny. Yours is like a desert island. Mine is like uh, you know, leave the big city, go to a smaller town. I probably watched way too much HGTV where they're like in a small town, you know? Um, <laughs> um, I've thought about that. I've also had the daydream of quitting it all. Like it's all too much. If I didn't have the job, then all this would be more manageable. Even though there was research that just came out and said that stay at home moms work an average of 97 hours a week. So probably I would guess I'm wrong about that, but, yeah. um, and then the, to your last point, when we have a lot of people who come to us who are frustrated with their career and they're trying to figure out what should I do next, but I don't want to end up miserable where I am now. And so there's this fear of like, I don't want to leave this bad situation to end up in another bad situation, or 
my life is a lot different than when I got this job 10 years ago and I want to pivot into something new. What is that? So it's like all these things combine fall into these categories of time management and happiness and where you spend your time and joy, like a lot of the words that you're using. Um, and I like that you are thinking about time management more from how we're spending our time and less about how to optimize it. I think a lot of times when people think of time management, it's all about how can you multitask more and get more things done in less amount of time? So that's why I'm so excited for this conversation today because I just feel like maybe maybe we need to take a step back from the hacks and the optimization for a second. Um, and, and so you you like to say that time isn't just the problem, it's the solution. Can you talk and explain that a little bit more? Yeah, Um it's the solution because the problem is what we talked about before, the sense of time poverty and that this constant feeling of not having enough time to get everything done. And what we find in the research, so I conducted a national poll um, with my team and we found that nearly half of Americans feel time poor. Um, moms tend to feel more time poor than dad, working parents, particularly when your partner is working. But our data showed that all types of people even those who don't have kids and those who don't work for pay to the point that you just made about um, stay-at-home moms, that um, the sense of busyness and rushing and this hectic pace of life with too little time is pervasive. And it's the problem because it's also really limiting. Like research shows that when we feel like we don't have enough time, it makes us less healthy. We're less likely to exercise. Uh, we don't go to the doctor. We delay going to the doctor. It makes us less nice. We're less likely to help others out, makes us less confident, and it makes us less happy. And so that's the problem. And I do want to actually touch back to this daydream and the answer to that of this sense of like, oh, if only I quit, then would I be happier? And this is what we tested. Um, and uh, with a couple of my colleagues, Marissa Sharif, Hal Hirschfield, we looked at what's the relationship between the amount of discretionary time people have and their happiness. And in our studies, um, across our studies, we saw a consistent pattern of results. And in one of the studies, we were analyzing data from the American Time Use Survey that looks at for tens of thousands of working and non-working Americans, how they spent regular day. And from that, we could calculate how much time they spent on discretionary activities and relate that to their happiness. And what was really interesting is the pattern of results that I mentioned, it's like an upside down U shape. So, which is interesting because it suggests that happiness goes down on both ends of the spectrum. Yes, those with too little time who feel time poor are less happy. And that's because they feel more stressed. But on the other end, you see that there is such thing as having too much time. In our data set, it was having more than approximately five hours of discretionary time in the day. You saw that people were less happy. And that's really interesting and important to recognize because, well, A, understanding why. <laughs> like, how is it as we're imagining, you're living, you're imagining like living in a small town me on the beach, how could it possibly be that days, you know, our lives in that, in that context would be associated with less happiness. And what we find is that people, we are driven to be somewhat productive. Now, like that is, we are averse to being idle. And so when we spend all the hours of our days with nothing to show for how we spent them, it undermines our sense of purpose. And from that, we feel less satisfied. And this is really important to sort of have in mind, because yes, there are absolutely ways of spending time that don't involve work that contribute to one's sense of purpose, you know, volunteer work, um, enriching hobbies. But I can absolutely say for me, as well as for many, actually work provides a great source of purpose. And it's understanding like what aspects of like, what are the parts of the work that do? What work can you take on that would give that sense of fulfillment? And it cautions us away from quitting everything, right? That the answer is actually not that having a whole lot more time would lead to greater happiness. Um, now the solution comes in because what you see in the, in the, in our results is like, yes, 
It goes down on both ends of the spectrum, but in the middle, it's actually pretty flat. And so that sort of suggests that, except at the extremes, it's not about how much time you have that's sort of determinant of heaviness. It's really how you invest the time you have. So the solution comes into play of understanding, based off of the research, how do we invest the hours of our days so that at the end of the day, you know, we're not, not feeling depleted. And at the end of the week, even if busy and our schedules are full, we feel fulfilled. Yeah. So that at the end of their lives, we feel, you know, satisfied. And so the solution comes into with being intentional about dedicating time, protecting time for actually is what I really think is more about protecting time for those activities that really feel worthwhile. And it's also about when you're spending time is being fully engaged so that you're making the most of the time that you're spending, not in terms of optim optimization and efficiency, but it's the quality of the time that you're really sort of digging in and savoring and getting out of that time, like as much joy and satisfaction as one can. It's interesting because my first job out of college was so boring. I had nothing to do. And I remember feeling exactly what you're talking about. I was on the opposite end of the spectrum. I had so much time and I had no purpose. And I had it, it like, it, it drained me almost more than being overly busy because I actually felt worse. I was like, here I am and I could be doing something worthwhile and I'm not. So I totally understand why the extremes happen. Um, now I want to talk about getting to that middle part and this like fulfilled piece of like, I was busy, but I feel good. And I feel like we can all remember where you've had a day like that, where you're like, today was busy, but like, I got good stuff done. Like I had enough time, like that balance of like, I had a moment to myself, but I did this thing. And I'm curious, especially when it comes to work and time and feeling like, you know, we're spending our time with intention like, what are your tips and advice for that? Because sometimes people also don't have a ton of control over their time at work. Sometimes somebody, you know, usually you have a boss or a manager who might be controlling some of that. But like, what is what is the research show about this work when it relates to people on a job too? Yeah. And there's so many sort of pieces into that answering that question. <laughs> it's sort of like, and all, like I, know, I opened that of... Pandora's box there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that, one thing to be careful of is the sandy time. And what I mean by that, and I'll share an analogy that I think is super helpful. And I continue to sort of touch back on and rely on when making my own time spending decisions. And it absolutely relates to the workday in terms of prioritization and also to time outside of work. And it's, it's, in this is sort of this analogy that was really nicely shown in the short film that I share in the first day of class. And in the film, a professor walks into his classroom and he puts a large clear jar on the front of the, on the desk in front of the class. And then he pours in golf balls and he asks the students, is the jar full? They nod their head because it looks full. Then he pours in pebbles. The pebbles fill the spaces between the golf balls up to the top. And he asks, is the jar full? And the students nod their head because it looks full, but nope. Then he pours in sand. And the sand fills all of those spaces between the golf balls, between the pebbles, up to the top. And he asks the students, is the jar full? And by this point, the students are laughing. They're like, yes, the jar looks full. And then there was one more step. He pours in he brings out two bottles of beer. He pours one into the jar. He takes the other and he sort of takes a sip, perching himself in front of the desk. And he explains, this jar represents the time of your life. Those golf balls are those things that really matter to you. Your relationships with your family, your friendships, the work that you do that is fulfilling, that does, is in line with your purpose. The pebbles are the other important things like your job, your house. The sand is everything else. The sand is all of that stuff that fills your time without you even recognizing it. And what's really important to know is that if he put the sand into the jar first, all of the golf balls would not have fit. 
That is, if you let your time get filled with stuff, it absolutely will get filled with stuff, but that won't mean that you have time to spend on those things that really matter to you. And so it's so important to identify for yourself, both in work and outside of work, what are those golf balls? What are those ways of spending that are so important to you that do give you that sense of fulfillment, of satisfaction, of joy? And put those into your time jar first. Put them into your schedule. Protect within the workday time to do the work that really matters to you. And protect outside of the workday time or even within the work week time for those friendships, for those relationships that are so important to you to cultivate because sand will fill the rest of the time. Like your workday will get filled with replying to emails, like meaningless meetings at points. Um, and so it's so important to sort of protect time for that work that gives you the satisfaction that actually allows you to make progress um, so that again, at the end of the week, you look back and you're like, ah, oh, while busy, because there's lots that you've done, at least you've had those golf balls, like you've invested in those things that matter. And then one of the students asks, well, professor, what's the deal with the beer? And he's like, so glad you asked. The beer goes to show that no matter how busy you are, you always have time for a drink with a friend. So in the that. busyness <laughs> of our lives, there are, we do have time for these things that ultimately matter, like yeah. friendship. It's interesting too, because I feel like COVID, the beginning of COVID at least, I think put a lot of this into perspective for people, what you're talking about. Like I think for the first time ever, the sand was actually just removed from the table altogether because it was sort of this moment of crisis and everyone was figuring out. And I do think that prevented, or that created a shift where people maybe maybe got more clarity about what their golf balls were just to keep the analogy going. But yeah. then um, I feel like now that we're, you know, a few years out, it's like the sand has really just crept back in so quickly. So to your point, if you don't, if you don't prioritize the golf ball, the big important stuff, it is too easy to let the sand in. And it does, it sort of feels like this ripple effect of, of that. And I, it, and for people who are listening to just so we can spend more time on this episode about um, time and, and, and time management and all that, if you want to learn about how to create impact at work and what are those golf balls at work, I will put this uh, episode in the show notes, but we had Liz Weissman come on um, and she wrote a book called Impact Players and it's all about how to become invaluable at work. And she talks a lot about how you can figure out like basically how do you go to your boss and find out what are the impactful or the golf ball things that you need to be focused on Um I even interviewed this woman for my book, uh, Power Moves, and she um, took summers off for like 10 years. She worked at a big accounting firm um, and still got promoted to partner. And she says that one thing she was really good at, she always, now to use your metaphor, I understand, like she was really good at knowing what are the golf balls. And she always kept those at the forefront. And so like she was able to progress her career, even though she was very thoughtful about her time and she wanted her summers off to be with her kids that was really important to her so um I'm like remembering these other things and it's bringing me back to what you're talking about and I'm like yes this is like I've seen this work in real life even though I think it's really hard um I I guess you know when it comes to like actual tools that we can use what are and I think you mentioned that there's three tools that can help people become more time affluent like I guess, specifically, what are those and any, you know, practical or actionable tips that go with them? Yeah. Um, so time affluence is the opposite of time poverty. So this sort of time poverty, this acute feeling of not having enough time to do what you want to do. Time affluence isn't the too much time side. It is feeling that you have enough time to accomplish what you set out to do. And it's a subjective thing, how much time we feel like we have. And really interestingly, at the core of it is this confidence that mm -hmm. given the resources that you have available, that you are able to accomplish what you set out to do. And so interestingly, even though when we feel time poor, we tend to be less nice. We tend to sort of hoard our time for ourselves and not spend the time to help others. But what we actually found in our research um, is that when you spend some time 
to help someone out, it actually can increase your sense of time affluence because with that time that you spent, you're like, oh my gosh, I accomplished a lot. And by increasing your sense of self-efficacy, that's sort of like, oh my God, I accomplished a lot with that time. And it increases the sense like I can actually accomplish plenty with the time that I have available. And so by actually spending time on others, it can increase your sense of time affluence. Not having your time taken though, like not sandy time is often when other people are absorbing our time and requests are coming in when it's just easier to say yes than no, not sandy time, but you um, spending uh, time to help another from increasing self-efficacy can increase time affluence. Same with exercise, actually, for the same reason. When we feel time poor, we don't exercise. Um, but when you actually carve out the time to exercise, exercise itself is its own mood booster. It helps offset anxiety, helps offset depression, and it increases self-esteem and self-efficacy. So actually, you know, when you do carve out time in the morning to exercise, it's like, oh, I can do this day, like bring it on yeah. and increase a sense of time affluence as is actually experiencing getting into states where you, um, experience a sense of awe so that you gain this perspective that like the world is bigger than you and, and like awe gets evoked through nature, um, through going to sort of seeing live performances, um, through like intense social connection. And so actually investing in these activities, these experiences that expand your sense of self through efficacy or awe, expand your sense of how much time you have. And actually, I want to, if touching back to what you were saying before this sort of golf ball analogy and how you can see it sort of get picked up um, through so many sort of lenses, and it's so important within the work that we do to identify what are those golf balls, what are those high impact yeah. um, ways of spending. And also from my perspective, or what are those really satisfying ways of spending? And a tool that I um, suggest people do is actually time track. And over the course of your week, um, keeping track, and you can do it very rudimentarily. There's like a PDF that you can just like print out um, from my website even. But it's writing down for each half hour, what activity are you doing? And then rating on a 10 point scale coming out of that activity, how do you feel? how satisfied, fulfilled, happy. And I encourage folks to do this for a week. And while admittedly, it's sort of tedious to track your time, it is so helpful because at the end of the week, you have this fantastic personalized data set that you can look for yourself. And when you're writing your activity, it's not just work, you know, or- Yeah, be a little more specific, know. right? <laughs> yeah, like what work task? Yeah. And so you can pull out, like across your week, what are those activities that are most satisfying and fulfilling? But you can even look within your workday. Yeah. What are those activities that are satisfying? And so often they're satisfying because they give you a sense of progress. That's like the real work that is applying yeah. your skills. You get into this flow state. It's also often you see the social connection, like genuine sort of friendship that develops um, within the work that we do is so important. There's an interesting um, question in the Gallup data where they asked, do you have a best friend at work? And even though only two out of 10 Americans say they have a best friend at work, those who do are significantly more engaged. They're better performers. They're more satisfied on their jobs and they're more satisfied in their lives. And so there's there's that too, that sort of social component um, that is so critical for happiness in general. Like yeah. we need this sense of belonging, social connection, and to the extent that you, since we spend so much of our time at work, to the extent that we can cultivate um, that within our work hours, it's like so fun. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that like relationships and purpose super 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 important to actually enjoying your work and it's interesting people will ask me a lot like how do I find a job how do I find a job and I always tell them don't focus on the job but focus on like the company first because the idea is to find 
the company who aligns with your values. Maybe we can get a little bit more aligned with the purpose there. And then ideally people who have similar values to that might work there, the relationship building. And it's like, I just feel like in the sea of all the options and the overwhelm that comes with searching for a new job, it's like trying to target or narrow it down to something more simple to your point. Like there's all the job postings are the sand and companies are the golf balls, you know, a lot more. And I'm going to use this metaphor, like the whole yes. thing. <laughs> Great. It really works well. Um, but I completely agree as someone who had a work best friend at my last company. I mean, truly a best friend. Like I still talk to her all the time. She was a, a bridesmaid in my wedding. It made the days totally different than a job where, where I did it. Um, so I, I feel that hundred percent. I, I want to talk a little bit, you, you've, you've mentioned, um, you know, when we, we spend our time with these distractions or these sand things and, or, you know, obviously life is full of distractions and it could be from, you know, the constant invites or the pressure to feel like you quote, should be doing this or going to that place. How can you, sidestep the distractions and not feel bad about it because there's like it's not it's not even like a FOMO it's a guilt of like oh I should be going to this thing because it would be good for my career like when you were on the train like you probably felt like you should be going to New York and doing those speaking events that kind of thing yeah and I think that the honestly (laughs) since we are in love with this golf ball analogy I think when you realize the cost of um letting your time get filled with sand, then it's like, oh, okay. It's like a motivator to be like, I'm not going to do this anymore. Totally. Because (laughs) um, what happens is then we're going to get burnt out and we're not going to be helpful to our organization, to our careers or anything. Like when we are spending our days, our years, you know, our careers with sand, we're going to, we're going to give up at some point. Yeah. Right. And actually um, with the, sort of introspection that we developed from the pandemic, I think we are less tolerant of just sort of moving through the grind um, without a sense of meaning. So understanding the cost of not saying no is really helpful. And I suggest people use filters from like as these incoming requests um, of purpose and satisfaction and happiness. So in the purpose as you were referring to, it's so important to think about like the why of the work and not this general notion of why, which, and like productivity, which is a lot of where shoulds come in of like, we should be doing this, but like for you personally, why? Why is that important? And why do you value that? And I share in Happier Hour an exercise to sort of make this identification for you when each individual, their purpose a little more tractable, but with the five whys exercise. So, you know, the work that you do, why is that important? And then your answer to that is like, well, why is that important to you? And once you answer five layers of why, it really uncovers for you, what's really motivating, what's driving you. Um, And that can help identify, that can also help identify within your job, what are those activities that are going to be the most meaningful because they're having the impact that you care about, but also it can help in the job selection of like, what is, what is a job that it might sort of look different because the job description is like maybe that first why, but the, like the layers below of those next whys is really getting at the core of what, what motivates you. And so then you can look beyond job description of look at, okay, like what's the impact that I could potentially have, um, which is quite clarifying. So all to say to offset the guilt is just realizing the cost, both for you emotionally, but also for those around you. Like you're not going to help anyone if you burn out and leave your job. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So understanding well, the, the goal is that. not to burn out. The goal is to keep yourself from burning out by creating, you know, these routines and like rituals or whatever you need to do to be able to find a nice, and I, I, I'm, I'm scared about using the word balance, but I'm going to use it. And hopefully we can all take it with a grain of salt, but like 
find some sort of way to maintain that versus like the high highs and the low lows and the burnout, then the extreme here, you know, like the, we keep learning the same lesson over and over again, which is extremes do not work, right? Like you need the 80, 20 rule of like 80% of the time you're in this good, you know, if that's that you, you, you feel like your time is being used. Well, are you going to have an extreme moment here or there? Yes, I'm sure you will. But um, it's like, how can we, how can we not? And obviously the research is showing like, Hey, if you go through your life and it's just busy, busy, busy all the time, you're not going, that's not the way to build a fulfilled life nor career. And I think people know that, but they struggle with like, well, how do I actually do that? So your exercise of the five whys, doing the time tracking and, and, and keeping track of, okay, where did I feel the most energized or which of these tasks were the most draining? Um, As we wrap up, are there any other examples or exercises or tips when it comes to trying to make sure that you're spending your time intentionally that you want to share? Yeah. And those tips that we've shown, talked about thus far, has been about identifying, identifying what are those golf balls? What are those activities that are satisfying? What are those activities that will be fulfilling? So that then the strategy comes into play of how do you craft or design a week with protecting time and putting those golf balls into your schedule, like the sort of deep thinking work that you can protect, like log out of email, put your phone away so that you can get into a flow state. And that's really satisfying. So it's like, it's not about sort of quantity of like how many things you do. It is just ensuring that you have spent time during your week on those things that matter. And to sort of pull to light the importance of relationships also sort of outside of work, of recognizing just how precious our time is. You know, like when folks are young, there's this notion of we have all the time in the world. So the urgency is coming from other people's urgency of like the requests coming in and the shoulds, as opposed to like the urgency of like what's important to make sure that I am cultivating in my life now that is going to or cultivate like spending my hours now so it leads to a life um that is overall satisfying and there's a couple of um activities that I suggest folks do one is quite poignant writing your eulogy so your own eulogy that is how do you want to be remembered at the end? And this leads you to sort of project to the end of your life and looking back, what do you want people to say about you? Um, What impact do you truly want to have in writing your eulogy? It leads you to identify for yourself, what are your values? And by taking that broader perspective, and, you know, some people are uncomfortable with it because they're, you know, it's like, oh, this, I'm uncomfortable with the idea of that but it's absolutely a exercise about life. What life do you wanna live? And when you take that broader perspective of your time, thinking about your years in life overall, that highlights what is valuable and what really matters. And that will inform how you spend your hours today because how we spend our hours sum up to our days, our years and our life overall. So. Our time is precious because yes, it is limited, but it's also because it is so valuable. It is the sort of substance of our life. It's the experiences that we have and it's the memories that we will have. And so one resource we cannot replenish when tomorrow is gone, you know, tomorrow is gone, right? So absolutely, yeah. Oh, this has been so good. Can we wrap up with you letting people know where they can follow your work, get your book, remind them it's it's happier hour, but tell them all the things. Yes. Um, <laughs> through my own time tracking, I learned social yes. media is not my <laughs> happy space. So I'm actually not, I'm only on LinkedIn, but um, on my website, Cassie M. Holmes, uh, dot com. there you'll see my research and information about the book, but happier hour. Um, I is the book that I sort of worked so hard to pull together all of these insights. It's also an audio book for all of us time poor people. So you can like listen to me <laughs> read it um, while driving or, you know, walking around. Um, but I really 
I really am excited that these insights from my research from others can help people spend, you know, happier hours and find more joy in their lives. Absolutely. And I love, I, I mean, I love all the tools that you've mentioned today. They're so practical. They're so actionable. And that I think is the difference between reading about something and being like, yes, I agree. I'm on board with it and actually being able to implement it into your life. So thank you for taking the research and actually putting it into, you know, terms and words that we can understand metaphors that we we can talk to our friends and family about. And um, I, I certainly want to make it, a language in my own household is what are our golf balls? What's the sand? You know, I love that. I think it's great. Um, so Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today. And I will link to your website and your book in the show notes. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Lauren. This was fun.